welcome. At this point in a physics course, some students are still reaching for a relevant formula and hoping that a few keystrokes on the calculator will lead them to a correct answer. I call this approach formula roulette, and as you prepare to move on from Newtonian mechanics to electricity and magnetism, it's going to be a test of your problem-solving abilities, and formula roulette is going to lead to disaster. I hope these videos have encouraged and modeled how to approach a problem in a deliberate way that will help you solve new problems in the future. If you haven't developed that habit, start today. I'm Dr. Courtney. This problem statement is a simple one, but it'll take us a little work to get there. We're going to use Newton's second law for rotational motion. And the definition of torque and what we'll do is to express the angular position as a function of time in terms of physical parameters. of this uh, system. As we make a plan and develop this problem, we have a simple pendulum. The pendulum has a length, or the arm has a length, and when the pendulum is displaced, it is displaced by an amount, by an angular amount, which we'll call theta. Now because of the parallel axis theorem, this angle here is also theta, and that will be helpful to us shortly. What forces are acting on the system? Well, gravity acts on the mass. So the force here is equal to the mass of the mass and the gravitational acceleration. So as we make our plan, we're going to use Newton's second law to find an expression for the position as a function of time. And specifically, remember that Newton's second law says that the torque vector is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration vector that is for rotational motion. So then what we need to do is express the torque at this point the magnitude of the torque in terms of the mass and the length of the moment arm. Then we need to express the moment of inertia in terms of the mass and the length. The torque is also going to have gravitational acceleration in it. And then we can express the angular acceleration in terms of the position as a function of time, and we remember that the acceleration is the second derivative of the position with respect to time. And that's what we'll use. At that point, we will put these together and it will be a differential equation, and we will solve the differential equation. Then we'll be ready to work toward the things that are asked for specifically in this problem. That will require us to determine the length in terms of the period. The way that we'll do that is to compute the acceleration in that direction uh, from acceleration as a function of time from the position as a function of time, which we will have just solved for. Then we need to return to the uh, differential equation, so that's in 2D, and substitute our solutions for 
uh, theta as a function of time and the acceleration as a function of time. At that point, we will be able to solve it for the length and then compute the specific answers. As we evaluate this problem, we begin with Newton's second law that says that the torque is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. Now in this case, we have, uh, using the right hand rule, right hand, not left hand, we have the moment arm crossed with the force vector and the positive, or the direction of torque is going to be into the board. We can call that our Z direction. And so we're only concerned about that direction of the torque. So if we want the magnitude of the torque, that's going to be equal to the moment of inertia times the acceleration in the Z direction or into the board. Now to express that magnitude in terms of the mass, the length, and gravitational acceleration, we need the definition of torque as the moment arm crossed with the force vector. And so the magnitude from this relationship is the length of the moment arm times the direction or times the force, which is equal to mg, which is in a negative direction. So we have negative mg times the sine of the angle between them. So if we do steps B and C together here, the magnitude of the torque can be expressed as the mass times the length squared. That is the moment of inertia for a point mass. And then we have the acceleration is the second time derivative of the position function. So now we have two expressions for the magnitude of the torque, which we will set equal to each other. And we see that a couple of these terms are going to cancel. Let's divide through by ml squared so that we have the differential term by itself. We see that mass cancels and one term of the length cancels. And we then have our second order differential equation. Now, this differential equation is hard to solve. It's hard because of this sine theta term. It would be much easier if this were a differential equation with a linear term of theta on the right. There's good news. The good news is that we can use the small angle approximation and achieve exactly that. So as an aside, recall from calculus class, or you could look it up, the Taylor expansion for sine of theta. It says that the sine of theta is, equal, is approximately equal to theta itself plus theta cubed over 3 factorial plus some smaller terms. So what does a small angle mean? Let's let theta equal 15 degrees, just for argument's sake. That's equal to 0.00663 radians. And this relationship requires us to be in radians. So then we have the sine of theta is approximately equal to that value plus 0.00663 cubed over 3 factorial. That second term it ends up being 4.9 times 10 to the negative 8. And so we see that this number is way down in the mud compared to the number of significant digits we're interested in in this problem. So really, the sine of theta is almost equal to theta. So we're going to write instead that the second time derivative of the position is equal to g over l times theta. And we'll go from here. I'll be right back. 
I'm back having consolidated what we've done so far into expressions that we are going to continue to work with. We can guess a solution to this differential equation of the form theta as a function of time equals theta naught, the initial value, times the cosine of the angular frequency times time. Once we have the position as a function of time, we can take the second derivative and achieve the acceleration as a function of time. So the first derivative with respect to time gives us minus omega times theta naught times the sine of omega t. And the second derivative gives us our acceleration as a function of time which is minus omega squared times theta naught times the cosine of omega. Now what we're going to do is to take this expression for the acceleration and this expression for the position as a function of time and put it back into our differential statement. So then we have, instead of the second derivative of the position with respect to time, we will put in our acceleration. And on the right-hand side, we still have the coefficient minus gravitational acceleration over L times the position, which is theta naught cosine omega t. So now we have some things that cancel out here as well. The initial angle cancels out, and the entire cosine term cancels out. And we have a negative on both sides that cancels out. And we are left with omega squared equals g over l. It's getting very simple at this point. What are we looking for? We're looking for l, and we're looking for l in terms of the period. So now we need to recall that the relationship between the angular frequency and the period is this. Omega is equal to 2 pi over the period. So we can substitute that into our expression 2 pi over the period squared equals g over l. We're still trying to get l by itself, and so we can multiply by l and divide by this term, and we will get that the length is related to the period in this way. For the period of 250 milliseconds, then, we have a length of 9.82 meters per second squared times that period in seconds must convert over 2 pi quantity squared and we come up with a length of 0 0.0155 meters which is um, to two significant digits 0 0.016 meters because we have seconds squared in the denominator seconds squared in the numerator we are left with units of meters which we expect for length, so that's good news. I will leave the next two to you to compute, and when, I'll just tell you that I get when the period is six seconds, the length ends up being nine meters, and when the period is 2.5 minutes, which you must convert to seconds in the substitution, I get a length of 5,600 meters. So once we've gone through the development, the actual computation is not difficult. But it does cover an awfully wide range, uh, several orders of magnitude. So how can we tell whether our answer makes sense? First of all, we check our units, which we did. And it's not difficult to verify that our length does come out in units of meters. So I'm satisfied that that is correct. What about the magnitude? Well, it's difficult for me to experiment with any of those combinations, but what if I had a period of one second? That's, that's something I have an intuitive sense for. So what if L, no, not L, again, we're starting with the period. What if T equals one second? If you put that into our expression for L, you come out with L equals 0 0.25 meters, which is 25 centimeters. 
So one second, 25 centimeters, that I can test. I can make a model for that. Also, I want you to note that in our expression for the length and as it relates to the period, mass is absent. That means that note result is independent of mass. And so I have a little mass here, a wiffle ball, on a string, and if we measure off approximately, say 25 centimeters, and I set it in motion at a relatively small angle, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, that's pretty good. That's about a second. Not precise, of course, but what we're trying to do is figure out whether our answer makes sense. So by checking our units and doing a little experiment of our own, we have confidence that the theoretical relationship we developed is correct.